I think that it's really important to point out Donald Trump, uh, yesterday I heard him say that he was tired of Joe Biden talking about how Russia has nuclear power and is a nuclear force. And it sounds like, you know, when you say that, that you're scared. And President Trump said, you know what Joe Biden should be saying? We are a nuclear power and we know what to do. And that, I think, therein lies the difference is that Donald Trump was no uh, wimp. He wasn't anyone who just said, you know, I want to bring troops home and avoid war. He built up the Defense Department. He built up America's power. He used the power with Soleimani. He, he was really able to, to show um, an unpredictability when it came to using America pow America's power. But he has his criteria, and this is, I think, a really important point. What is best for the U.S.? <laughs>
fair share of 2% was a huge mistake. So what did the Germans do? They decided to say, we're gonna pay it all at once in one year to catch up. This is a huge admission that they have been on the wrong track for 16 years. Then they turn around and they say, we gotta stop this Russian pipeline. This is historic, this is unprecedented. Don't forget, just a few months ago, not very long ago, Senate Democrats, the Biden administration, and the government of Chancellor Merkel in Germany all came together to say, drop the sanctions on Putin, on, on the Russian Nord Stream 2 pipeline, because they all said, this may encourage him. Uh, if, we, if we squeeze him too much, he's gonna lash out. Well, obviously they were wrong and they completely got it uh, upended. And so the sanctions should have been put on or stayed on, we should say, but the, the Democrats, the Biden administration should have kept that pressure on. And I think that we would have a different scenario. But when Putin is looking at Afghanistan, and by the way, if people are not talking enough about the, the uh, policy that Biden put in place to drop the Houthis from the terrorist watch list. As soon as they did that, Dave, we had se a couple of months later, what did the Houthis do? They were bombarding the UAE. Abu Dhabi was receiving missiles from the Houthis. Now, this was by official Washington, largely ignored. There wasn't a correlation made between, hey, you know, Joe Biden and the Biden administration and all the Democrats just took the Houthis off the terrorist list. And what happened? They started acting like terrorists. And so you, you, you literally have to um, push official Washington to see that these weak policies translate globally into terrible situations. I don't think it's too much to say that Joe Biden's weakness is causing war, scandal, uh, destruction. And, and we have to be able to shake the Senate Democrats because the Germans now see that. Uh, and it's, I never thought I would see it in my day. And they're certainly not saying Rick Grinnell was right, Donald Trump was right, but they're coming awful close. So let's stick with that Germany situation for a minute because so you were ambassador to Germany under Trump. And if you listen to the media throughout all of that, um, you know, Trump was mean and scaring people all the time and you went in there and you weren't listening to anybody and the other ambassador wasn't happy with you and all of this stuff. However, things were basically working in terms of all of our international agreements. And we were at least trying to encourage people to pay a bit more, which as you just said, now they're catching up with. Uh, did everything shift overnight basically once, uh, once Biden took over? I think that there's a combination of once Biden took over and once Merkel was gone, it was relatively at the same time. And, you know, Merkelism really didn't work. We had 16 years of, and, and I'm passionate about this subject, is that I believe that Chancellor Merkel, in making her policy Germany first, she decided to move the German uh, transatlantic relationship away from the West. Instead of making a Western facing alliance where you stand with the West and you do things uh, that, that benefit the West, she decided to have a foreign policy like Switzerland and be everybody's friend and to sell cars you know, in Moscow and Beijing and Tehran and everywhere else. And, and don't forget, when, when I arrived in Germany, uh, I was walking around one day and I, and I walked past this hotel youth hostel and I looked over and it was literally, I'm not exaggerating, the property of North Korea in the middle of Berlin. And I went back to the embassy and I was like, what the hell? <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a North Korean hotel youth hostel in the middle of Berlin. I mean, they're under international sanctions. This is illegal. And, there, and you know, everybody at the State Department was like, yeah, but I guess we've allowed that to happen. And I said, no, 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 no guessing. This is unacceptable. So I, I took it to Chancellor Merkel and, you know, there were a lot of excuses. Oh, it's not really us. It's it's this management company. And I said, I don't care. It's in the middle of Berlin. Shut it down. You're violating U.N. sanctions. They eventually shut it down. They weren't happy with me for pointing that out. But I wasn't happy with them for violating international sanctions. My point in telling you this is that they've moved away from the West for 16 years. Well, the German Marshall Fund has just applauded them as, you know, this great economic power. 
And yet, I think that there's a difference. You can bifurcate the transatlantic alliance from the Western-facing alliance, the Western alliance. And, and Merkel decided to just be a part of this uh, you know, transatlantic alliance, which was not Western-facing. She's the one who moved Germany and Europe away from the West. And now I think they're scrambling to say, uh, yikes, we might have encouraged war in Ukraine. Okay, so with all of that in mind, um, none of this happened for the four years under the guy that you worked for. And everyone kept saying, oh, but Trump is Putin's puppet and all of these things. And yet, oddly, Putin made a move on Crimea when uh, Joe Biden was vice president. And then he cooled it off for four years and then made a move when Biden was president. Are any of these things connected or am I a crazy conspiracy theorist? Right? <laughs> I know you personally, you're not crazy. Uh, but don't forget that we should also put in there though that um, Putin moved on Georgia under, under uh, Bush, under President Bush. Um, this is not a partisan statement to say that um, you've got to be able to put America first and articulate um, the responses of, of the US government. And you know, I, I think that it's really important to point out Donald Trump, uh, yesterday I heard him say, that he was tired of Joe Biden talking about how Russia has nuclear power and is a nuclear force. And it sounds like, you know, when you say that, that you're scared. And President Trump said, you know what Joe Biden should be saying? We are a nuclear power and we know what to do. And that, I think, therein lies the difference is that Donald Trump was no uh, wimp. He, he wasn't anyone who just said, you know, I want to bring troops home and avoid war. He built up the Defense Department. He built up America's power. He used the power with Soleimani. He, he was really able to, to show um, an unpredictability when it came to using America pow America's power. But he has his criteria, and this is, I think, a really important point. What is best for the US? And I'll finish by saying, you know, the State Department needs to learn this lesson because when you talk about America first, and all of the great things about what that means to be an America first advocate. Um, it doesn't mean America alone. And there's a way to articulate America first, and I believe this passionately, that America first helps our allies and others. When America is out front trying to uh, push forward democracy, human rights, the rule of law, guess what? Every economy benefits. We see that inflation is spiking now, economies are not doing well. When America puts itself first, capitalism and the rule of law thrive. That brings up every other country. We should have State Department uh, ambassadors overseas who articulate why an America first policy is good for them. There should be no apologies about this. It's better to have America first than to allow Russia or China to put themselves first. And I think what we've seen from 16 years of Merkel, it's much better for America first than to put Germany first. So who do you think Biden is putting first right now? I mean, we it seems like a lifetime ago, but literally only three weeks ago, right before this whole thing started, we had about a two week window of every day where Biden, it sounded like he was basically acting as Putin's PR guy. He kept being like, well, he's probably gonna go, maybe he'll go. These are the 16 things we don't want him to do. Here's a bunch of stuff he can do. I mean, what is our policy at this point? Look, um, I don't want to get too philosophical or, or theoretical here, but the opposite of America first is consensus, especially consensus with the Europeans. And I spent eight years at the UN, and I can tell you inside the Security Council that anytime there's a policy or a statement coming out of the Security Council, it's the lowest common denominator of what 15 countries believe, and it's not putting America first, certainly not putting democracy, human rights, uh, the rule of law first. And so Joe Biden is trapped in official Washington uh, ideas that he wants to be loved by um, the world. He talks, you know, I know all these world leaders. He really prioritizes the applause from the globalists. And so when you think about it, um, he, he really wants the Europeans to be pleased. The reason he dropped the sanctions on Nord Stream 2 is because Merkel and the Germans at the time asked him to. He maximized being with the Germans, being with the Europeans, having them love him. Look no further than the Iran deal, uh, Iran deal 2. 
And and now we we see the Europeans saying, wait a minute, this deal, uh, we're going to have to put it on ice because it's going south. When the Europeans are saying we need to stop this process and the Biden team is not the one calling it first, we've got a big problem when you're behind the Europeans. But this is the policy. Now, I can go through you know, each area of the world. Look at Venezuela policy now. We're moving and transitioning into engagement again, which already failed with the Venezuelans, simply because there's a bunch of Latin countries that want us to do that. And Joe Biden is leaning in and letting them determine that policy. The same thing in the Balkans. I worked very hard on Kosovo, Serbia. We had four economic agreements. You know what the policy is now? Let the Europeans lead on this issue. And you know, this is the whole 1990s crowd filled with NGOs that love to write white papers and tell rich people to give them money to, to think about these issues, but they're not making sense at all. Do you think that these people, without getting too far into the philosophical part then, do you think that, that we, he at least has competent people I mean, when, when you listen to Kamala Harris talk about this stuff, you know, Ukraine is small, Russia is big, even Tony Blinken, I mean, all of, they, they don't sound competent to me. Putting aside that you may have a philosophical disagreement with them on, on what U.S. strength should be or something like that, do, do they strike you as competent people? But a friend in need is a friend indeed, Dave. <laughs> uh, I mean, look, um, no, they're not competent. And I, I blame the Sacramento media for allowing Kamala Harris as a woman and as a black person to rise and, and win all of these different offices simply because of her identity. She wasn't qualified. She doesn't have the capacity. And I honestly will, will double down on that. If you look, there's no possible way Susan Rice and Ron Klain did not prepare her with a good book of, of what to say and what to do and what the policy was. I don't think it was a lack of preparation. I think it is a capacity issue that she doesn't understand these issues. Um, she's been allowed to rise to the top uh, without any vetting from the media. There's been no uh, push until she got into the presidential and then the national media a little bit were like, wait a minute, you're not really ready. And so she imploded. But the Sacramento media allowed her just to you know catapult and take over um, I, I don't think she's qualified. I think Anthony Blinken should have been fired after Afghanistan. I don't understand why he's still around. He's totally weak. Wendy Sherman, the deputy at the State Department, you know, her nickname is What Do You Want, Wendy? When she goes into ne negotiations, she gives away the store. She did it in North Korea, in Iran, with Russia. I, I don't know how many times we're going to put her forward. She's the te uh, terrible negotiator for the United States. And then, you know, Susan Rice is behind the scenes supposedly doing domestic policy, which she's not qualified for. But I think she's pulling the string of, of all of these other positions. Remember, Susan Rice, when she was national security advisor, had two deputies at the NSC. One was Avril Haines, who runs the intelligence program as DNI. And the other was Anthony Blinken, who's now running uh, the State Department. So diplomacy and intelligence all are really under Susan Rice, they're her deputies, she chose them. And that just means Obama is pulling the strings. You know, there's this philosophy, and I think I agree with it, that uh, Barack Obama couldn't be the far left progressive that he really wanted to be. Because as a black man, he was, in, he was very nervous about being, um, you know, somebody who was in the middle and being accepted by all the, the polite sides. And I find that to be a phony, um, uh, you know, kind of analysis. But nevertheless, he he wasn't as progressive as people uh, said that he was going to be. But now unleashed in this Obama third term with a puppet like Biden, I think the reality is is that Susan Rice and Ron Klein and everybody from the Obama administration is back into this Biden team that the Obama third term is unleashed and they really are just using Joe Biden as a puppet and as an empty suit to kind of let go and, and really try all these hard left progressive ideas. Since it's imploding, I think uh, they now have a good scapegoat where they can say, you know, oh, Joe messed it up and, and maybe they'll try to adjust. See them a little bit trying to adjust, um, but they're not getting it fast enough. By the way, what you're saying is not like some crazy idea that Obama wanted the third term. I mean, there is that famous interview of him saying, boy, I wish I could have a third term where I was behind the scenes
basically acting as the puppet master. I mean, it's his words. Yeah. So, you He's know, you're not, just pu- you're not just pulling this out of nowhere. Do you think that this mainly boils down to America's energy sector? I mean, if you just listen to what we're talking about suddenly in the last week and gas prices going crazy, $8 in, in Los Angeles, really nuts stuff, that they keep now saying, well, this is the time for the Green New Deal. This is the time for electric cars. That in some ways, this is exactly what they wanted. It's scary to think that they would view every everything that's happening and somehow <laughs> come up with the idea that they got to get more progressive and more lefty. But but they always do, right? I, I mean, think do, they, do they are. Ever look I in think, the mirror. Yeah. I, I think they are. I think that they're reading this and saying this is our opportunity. Um, it's crazy to think about that they uh, are not looking at the highest inflation and the highest gas prices. Um, and, and the fact that um, the American people are, you know, overwhelmingly saying this is a disastrous administration, worse than Jimmy Carter, the numbers keep going down. Um, you've even got some Democrats now rising up and saying, you know, this, this blaming Putin for the high gas prices is ridiculous. But, you know, you can't talk about these issues without talking about the, the dutiful media in Washington. I mean, they're allowing this to happen. I mean, the New York Times, CNN, AP, the Washington Post are literally working for the ruling party. If, if we saw this happening in another country, we would call it out. We would say you don't have free media. You, you have official media of the Democratic Party, of the ruling party, of, of the president. And there's no question that the New York Times and the Washington Post and the AP work for the Democrats. They, they can't uh, critique the Democrats to save their life. And I think this is the crisis that we find ourselves in. Because if you stay in Washington like Joe Biden does and all of his people, you know, Washington is exploding. Um, it, it's getting, every time you go, there's a new crane and a new building and the budgets are getting bigger and $30 trillion in national debt. The joke is now on us that live outside of Washington. Why do we keep expecting the media who live there, the politicians who live there, the lobbyists who live there, they're never gonna tear down their city. They want a bigger, better city. The only way to drain the swamp is to dig trenches with fresh water and get that muck out. And that means we gotta start sending people who don't wanna live, work, and go to church in Washington, D.C. We need people who want their social life back in their home districts so they go, they vote, and they leave. I will tell you two people who do that and that I I admire, uh, you know, there's more than two, but the two that I see constantly doing that is Ron Johnson and Ted Cruz. Their their lives are back in their home states and and that includes their social life. And, And so they're not part of Washington and they can make better decisions because of it. Do you think Trump has any regrets related to not draining the swamp as maybe more, more quick. I mean, clearly the swamp still exists, right? He's, he's not president and the swamp exists. Do you think there were more things that he could have done or it was almost just an impossible thing to do within four years or maybe that he didn't even fully grasp the severity of it, how entrenched it was and what he was really up against? So uh, I would say, this is my opinion. Um, I have not had this conversation with President Trump uh, fully. I've had it a little bit on the sides. But um, I think by the end of the administration, by the end of the four years, there was an admission that uh, you really have to dig deep in Washington into the agencies and get your people. You remember when Donald Trump came, um, he had he told me that he had never stayed in Washington, D.C. overnight until uh, the week of his inauguration. So he was a true outsider. He had participated in some of the, you know, donations for both sides and and the processes, but he was a true outsider. And so uh, coming in as an outsider, he was thinking like an outsider and he thought, you know, I got to get the White House right. I got to get the loyalists there and you run the government from the White House. Over time, I think he realized, wait a minute, you got to really get uh, into the agencies and dig deep and get your people in there. And so there was an admission that we had to do more of that you know, I blame the people that were really around him in the very beginning not to say, wait a minute, you you got to have loyalists across the board. Um, but I think that lesson was learned through time. 
and would have been fixed in a second term. So I want, I want to go more towards that, but I just want to back up for one second uh, on the Russia-Ukraine stuff. When you hear from uh, some of your counterparts that are probably still in some of these ambassadorships and, and still overseas, are, are people quietly saying to you, boy, we sure do wish that orange guy was still around because this wouldn't have happened? Because it seems fairly obvious to me yeah. that this would not be happening if Trump was president. A a absolutely, it's across the board, um, all around. I'll even go a little bit further. I'm getting uh, messages every single day from foreign service officers at the State Department who are saying, what a terrible mess we have. They're not happy with Blinken. Uh, they see this as weakness. Um, I mean, this is a real problem and and they see it. And these are people that I know personally uh, did not vote for, for President Trump because I have great relationships with them and they've told me and we've sparred about this before. Uh, but I respect so many foreign service officers uh, and their work because they, most of them, can salute the president and, and implement the policies of the president even when they don't like the president. And so they can separate that. Um, I actually always found it refreshing to have these political discussions with people because the ones who were really honest about, yeah, I'm a Democrat and I, I think this way, um, it was much better because uh, you could trust them, actually. You could see <laughs> their work yeah. and you knew they were implementing. And so I, I have great friends who voted for Biden who are Foreign Service officers and uh, I love talking to them and it, it makes a healthy environment. But many of them are admitting to me that they, uh, they can't believe that this is happening. So I had Nikki Haley on last week and, and she said something similar. And she also said something that you sort of referenced earlier about that the world wants America to lead. It, it really desperately does. It loves to hate on America in a way, but also really wants America to lead. I, I sense that's really what you think too, that it's like, if it's not us, Everybody just runs around like a chicken without a head. Yeah, I mean, look, I think the-, the Or China, you, or China. Yeah, you look, you look at the Middle East, you look at um, now Europe, um, and I would even put um, the Latin and South America in this category. Um, there's an open admittance that uh, under Trump, everything was better. Uh, they're just, they're literally able to say that now uh, more than a whisper, and they're right. They are right indeed. I thought you were giving me a long pause for a, no, a crushing they're, line they're, there. It they're, was just, they're, they're right. I mean, what else can you say? So, you know, I so, just. So what do you think? Yeah. What do you think Trump would be doing right now? I mean, or, or what would he have done for the two weeks before where Biden was basically coaching Putin in? What, what do you think Trump would have done then and now? So I hate this question. And I and I the reason why is, is because, you know, now we sit here and we have to answer the question of now, what would you do between a terrible and a really terrible choice? Mm -hmm. um, look, if I were in charge, if that's the the hypothetical, right, if you were in charge, what would you do? If I was in charge, um, we kicked Joe Biden out of the White House. Because really what happened was, is Biden let us down a terrible road. We got to turn around and go back and fix this, but uh, I'm pissed off that we have to be answering these questions of, uh, you know, now what are your choices between terrible and really terrible? If, we, if Donald Trump had been in charge all along, we wouldn't be in this process uh, that we are now to, to have a choice between bad and really bad. Um, I do think that this goes back to Afghanistan and the weakness that was showed by literally having uh, a president of the United States appear to be proud that he got 90% out. And the world you know, held their breath and were shocked and they looked at each other and were like, did he just say that we left 10% behind and he's proud of it? Everybody saw that. Um, you know, you, again, I, why is Secretary of State Anthony Blinken still in his job? He has failed miserably so many times and yet, he still has a job. I don't understand that. Well, I think it's because the media runs cover, basically what you were saying before about New York Times, Washington Post and everything else. So what, what do we do about that? I mean, OK, so you, you drain the swamp, you start doing things. Let's say Trump's magically president again and, and you do the things at the agencies you're talking about. 
there's still this media issue that that runs cover. Yeah, but you gotta and you lies gotta ignore, about all their mistakes. You gotta just ignore them. I mean, they all have paywalls, so don't pay it, and then you won't read it. And um, the reality is, is that with social media, you can educate the public about what the government is doing and be transparent. That's the goal. The goal is to get information, transparent information, honest information to the American public. We have developed the system of a filter that the media think that now they are in charge of information to the American people. Social media upended that just like you know our phones having uh, our bank accounts on it. We don't have to go in and see the teller anymore. We get to go straight to our account and we get to transfer money and, and control it. It's not unlike the media and that's why I think they're clamping down on getting Trump off social media. Uh, they don't want to see a, a debate. They want to control it. So they're applauding it. Um, it's, it's terrible for this country. It's why first and second generation Americans are the loudest pro-Republican, pro-Trump group because they left fascism, they left totalitarianism, they know what it's like and they see the signs with the media. Some of the proudest members of the America First crowd are first and second generation Americans. You wanna know who the problem is in this country? Seventh, eighth generation white liberals who haven't traveled enough. They don't understand how great America is. I'd like to have them travel a little bit more and, and then they will stop tearing our country down and realize that we're the greatest country in the history of the world. Yeah, wait, can you go a little further on this sort of second generation? Like the, the we're now seeing a huge explosion in conservative Latinos, that's one. Trump did, made major inroads in the, in the black community. It's a little unclear where that sits now at the moment. Um, but can you talk about that? Because that seems to me to be the, the future of this thing, not because of the color of their skin, or even their ethnicity, but because of the value stuff. Yeah, well, look, I don't even think that it's just the the Hispanics and Latinos anymore. Um, you know, certainly we know the stories of of Cubans who have left totalitarianism and fascism, and they become this rabid supporter of freedom. But it's I'm Eastern... in Miami, man. Come, yeah. come visit me; you'll see it. I have a joke about Miami, which I can't say because they'll hold it against me forever, but it's a very funny one, I'll tell you personally. Um, I love Miami and I love South Florida because it's so filled with people who are freedom fighters. Yeah. And, and if you've ever had a taste of not freedom, <laughs> you want freedom. And so I think what's happening too is Eastern Europeans, Chinese Americans, uh, Taiwanese Americans, people who have lived on a Russian Americans. I actually have some friends in LA who uh, born and raised in Russia who live here. They're some of the most pro-Trump, positive, uh, love America patriots that you've ever seen because they are like the canary in the coal mine for what's happening in our society for institutions that take away our freedoms. And, and I think you've got to listen to first and second generation Americans tell the story of why they came to America. And, and we have a problem with those in this country who don't travel and who continue to think, you know, I'm going to write a big check to BLM or something because I feel guilty and America is a racist country. And that, that's not what the people who are coming here are seeing. They're seeing a great place filled with freedom and democracy and opportunity. And yet uh, we need to get these white liberals who have been here for too long, who I call fat and happy, we need to get them traveling so that they can see how great America is. You know, Rick, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that all of those rich white liberals in Beverly Hills never voted to defund their own police. Isn't that bizarre? Of course. It really, not, not it their own. You, you know, you've mentioned America First a few times, and I actually, I spoke at a Republican congressional event here in Miami uh, a couple weeks ago. It was for about 80 Republican congressmen. And I was taking them questions after, and one of them asked me um, if they felt that the America First branding was okay, or was it too, because of the way the media talks about it, was it too associated with racism or white supremacy or something? Obviously, I know you don't think that, but, but what do you think that that, uh, what do, you, is, do you think there's anything that has to be done in terms of branding so that when people hear America First, there isn't like some sort of knee-jerk reaction because of the way the media talks about it? I mean, look, or, or again, I, it's ignore the media. 
I yeah, think I, I mean, I think, I think question. you got to ignore the media and not play yeah. into them. I mean, they have silly arguments. Everything is racist, sexist, homophobic. You know that. And uh, I think the more you just ignore them, go straight to truth telling. Um, social media is really powerful to be able to go straight to the people. We got to do more of that. We need help from Republican senators to uh, fix this big tech problem of try to si of how they try to silence us. Um, I think we got to grow our own media. Um, I, I think it's okay to say that we're always going to have media that are on the left or the right, that they bring their personal bias into this. Um, I think the danger comes when somebody stands up and says, I'm unbiased. I am the arbiter of all things. And so that person is dangerous because then you know for sure they're, they're a uh, silent liberal. Yeah, well, scratch a progressive find authoritarian. Um, sort of backing, tra backtracking again, what, what do you make of just sort of the worldwide response to this? You know, in the last couple of days, we're banning Russian vodka now, chasing MasterCard or booting Russia from their systems. There's all this talk about SWIFT. I mean, that the whole worldwide system, not just nation states, but corporations, everything seems to be coming down on Russia. Does, it, does that feel organic to you? Look, I, I think the corporate world is groupthink, right? I mean, right after January 6th, the, this, all the corporations were like, we're not going to give any money to any Republican. And so it's this reactionary thing. Um, you know, some of those same companies uh, refused to shut down their operations in Russia. Uh, I think it's OK that companies are always going to act um, in their own financial interests. We, we understand that they want to sell, they want to make money. Um, the public has a big role to play here. You know, how do we get people to, to put pressure uh, so that human rights and values become part of it? And, and I'm not a purist. You know, I, I will go shop at places where they give most of their money to Democrats. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to be one of those people. But I, there are moments where I think you got to take a stand. I'm not a big uh, believer in you know, uh, saying that we're going to boycott certain things. But I think that you can use your own power of your money. You have uh, the, the choice. Um, right now, I think with, with what Russia is doing, uh, we should apply financial pressure, personal financial pressure and swift. And companies should recognize that this is a, a belligerent moment from this com country. But I also think that 69 countries criminalize homosexuality and some of these same people who moralize about, oh, I can't do business with Russia, they're doing business with countries that will put a gay person in prison simply because they're gay. And so where does that line st stop? Um, I, I'll also say, you know, I've gotten hit from the foreign policy establishment because I, I said that I, I won't sign any letter that says we should have a no-fly, you know, implement a no-fly zone now, mm -hmm. or even a humanitarian no-fly zone. The idea that there's a, a light no-fly zone or a partial <laughs> no-fly zone is ridiculous. A, a no-fly zone is, is meaning you're gonna shoot down a you Russian plane. You gotta shoot something, yeah. Yeah, and, and I'm all against that. I do think, though, that the line in the sand is uh, a NATO, Ally. We have a treaty obligation. An Article 5 wire is tripped if there's an attack in Poland or on a NATO country. That's a different story because we got to have um, we got to set boundaries and we've got to enforce boundaries. What you see going on in Ukraine is heartbreaking, though. It's terrible. I mean, I, I watch, but all of the media are focusing on that. And I continue to believe that if the media all moved to the Congo and start telling us the stories of what's going on in the Congo, there'd be calls from neocons and others to have a no-fly zone in the Congo. And then they'd move to another country and it would just be this perpetual problem. What we need to do as Americans is recognize that the criteria that we have is what makes America uh, less safe. We have to respond to the national security threats for America. Never apologize about putting America first because we are largely a moral uh, country. I don't think that we're perfect, and I'm not saying that, but I am saying that we have the best system, a checks and a balance. I mean, every month there are stats going out on our economy, and there's a whole industry 
that will immediately say, yeah, that number is higher, or that number should be lower, or you didn't include this. Uh, we have transparency in our country. We should be really proud of the system because our system is the best. While not perfect, um, we should never apologize for the system. And, and I think that's where we have failed is we've allowed people to really tear down the greatest system and say, it's not the greatest system. Rick, you just gave a beautiful ending, but I will ask you one other question, which is that as a gay, as they say, will you come to Florida? You can bring Matt and David and the four of us, we will go out to dinner and we will say gay in front of people here in Florida and see what happens. Are you willing to take the risk? <laughs> Let's do it. We'll be there. Good seeing you, my friend. Thanks for joining. All the best. Thanks, Dave. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of nonstop yelling, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.